when you drive down Bates Pike, uh, approaching the church building in either direction, this is a beautiful part of God's country. And uh, the, the church building here has always been a, a, a lovely facility. But you know, the people are what make you grow. And we came here for the first time last century. In 1999, it, it was a bond that we formed with the members here that's been a blessing to our life ever since that time. It's always a, a great feeling to come here, whether I'm coming as a speaker or we're coming just to be with you. Uh, it's always a good feeling to be here, uh, to get a lot of hugs and uh, renew acquaintances. And, and I'm honored and thankful the shepherds have asked me to come to be uh, the speaker tonight now. The guy that spoke last week, he's my brother, but we don't look a lot alike. Okay? <laughs> brother Chad, he's my brother. Um, I, I was thinking as we were driving up this evening, and this is for your information and maybe something you don't care to look about, uh, but when we moved here the first week of August in 1999, the price of gas was 99.9 .9 cents a gallon. That's what it was, man. Uh, things have changed. In the English language, when we have a word, and on the front of that word, we put the two letters UN, the prefix UN, boy, that changes a lot. You have sweet tea, and then you have unsweet tea. There, there's a world of difference, right? <coughs> You have someone who's courteous or somebody that's kind and then you have somebody that's unkind. There's a world of difference. Looking at a person's body, someone is conscious and someone is unconscious. Well, there's a huge difference. Same way when you bring that over into the spiritual realm and you have the idea of faithful and then you have the idea of unfaithful, or faithfulness and unfaithfulness. Boy, there's a world of difference. And there's a contrast that's set forth in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, or rather verse 39 and verse 38, we read that the just shall live by faith. And then the writer of Hebrews makes this observation. He said, we are not of those who draw back unto perdition. So here's a picture of one group of people. They start the race, but somewhere along the line, they draw back, they pull out, they drop out. He said, we're not like that. He said, rather we're of those who believe to the saving of the soul. That's, that's a huge contrast. The starters who don't finish. <coughs> and the starters who do finish. Uh, I've been asked to speak tonight on the topic, what does unfaithfulness do to the home? So you've got the idea of unfaithfulness, and you've got the idea of the home or family, and the question is, what does unfaithfulness do to the home or to the family life? And as I think about this topic, there are probably going to be some things that I say tonight that are going to cause some of us to have unhappy feelings. It's not my intention to make anyone to be sad or angry, but to discuss the topic of unfaithfulness is to say sometimes people become unfaithful, and that's just not a sad occasion. But understand as the body of the Lord Jesus, when one of us is honored, we all rejoice. And when one suffers, we all suffer together. And so if tonight some of the things I say, as you think about somebody whom you know who has become or was unfaithful, if you hurt because of that, I want you to know in advance, I hurt with you. I hurt with you and I hurt for you. What I'd like to do tonight in our study is, I'd like to ask four questions. First of all, I'd like to ask the question, what does faithfulness, now we're going we're to zero in on unfaithfulness, but first of all, I want to ask tonight, what does faithfulness look like? And then secondly, and we won't spend much time on this one, 
Secondly, I want to ask the question, how does unfaithfulness creep into a person's life? And then thirdly, when, when unfaithfulness comes in, what, what's going on in the life of that person? And then finally, of the main thrust of our study tonight, what does that unfaithfulness do to the whole village? How does a Christian's unfaithfulness affect things at the house? Well, let's talk tonight on the positive. Here's what I'd like to do. If I do this right, I want to start up here on a high note, on a positive, and then we'll talk about that unfaithful aspect, and then if we, if we close like we want to, we'll try to end up on a high note, okay, uh, as we close this study tonight. What does faithfulness look like? Well, if we step outside of the arena of spiritual or religious matters for just a moment, and we think, here's a married couple. And then among the, these, these two people, when we talk about this married couple, they're faithful to one another. Well, what does that indicate? Well, in our society, most people in the process of the wedding ceremony, whatever that involves, are going to make some statements. They're going to make some pledges. We call them vows. And they may pledge something like, you know, in, in sickness and health, richer, poor, better, worse, and I'm going to love you like I love no one else in the world. Those are pledges. Those are vows. Those are promises. And when one is faithful to those vows, we describe that person as being faithful. You know, Job said this. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And so why then should I look on a maiden or on a young woman, Job 31 and verse 1? As a married man, Job was prepared to give his life's devotion, his love's devotion to his wife. He didn't have wandering eyes. He was true to that agreement. So on the marital side of faithfulness, we know what that is. Well, what about God? When you think about God's faithfulness, well, what comes to mind? We're not going to turn over there and dig in, but it's a really fascinating study. If, if you want to look at Psalm 89 sometime, one of the thoughts that's repeated over and over in Psalm 39 is God's faithfulness. And specifically, the, the writer of Psalms, down in about verses 30 to 35 in that neighborhood, he talked about a, a covenant that God had made with David. And he said, in that covenant with David, God said, my faithfulness will not fail. What does that mean? I'm going to be faithful from beginning to end to that covenant, to that agreement. And he said, the words that have come out of my mouth, he said, I'll not alter those words. What are you saying, God? I'm going to be true to my word. God said, I'm not a covenant breaker. I'm going to be faithful. And in the New Testament, we sometimes read those three words, God is faithful. Faithful. Now here's a walk down different lane for some of us. You ever seen any kids around here wearing an orange shirt that says God is faithful and also got some Chinese on it? 2011 bright orange camp shirt. And some of these people around here try to say it in Chinese. Now that, that's interesting. But God, God is faithful. So we think about God being faithful. You think about God being true to his word. And when God makes a promise or a covenant, he keeps it. Now, what about in the spiritual realm? When we think about being faithful to the Lord, in Romans 10 and verse 9, the message is about confessing with the mouth the Lord Jesus. Now think about that concept. It is the will of God that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2 and verse 11. When a person confesses Jesus as Lord, they're doing more than acknowledging that Jesus is the ruler. You remember what Thomas said? Thomas was not there when the other apostles saw Jesus on that day when he rose from the dead. But eight days later, Thomas was there and when he saw Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. Now, when Thomas proclaimed that Jesus was his Lord, the Lord of his life, what did that mean? That meant that Thomas was pledging his devotion, his loyalty, and his commitment to Jesus. Okay, that's what it means to be faithful to the Lord. 
Well, we keep our agreement for him to be the Lord of our life. Well, how do we show that? Jesus once asked a question. And the question was, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. Now, somebody might think, well, that's just a question. But listen now, that's a question with a powerful punch. Because what Jesus really was saying with that question was, if you claim that I'm the Lord of your life, then the expectation is you will do what I say. And so if you call me Lord, he said, you need to get with the program and do what I say. That's faithfulness. Was Jesus faithful to his heavenly Father? Well, of course he was. And on one occasion, Jesus said, I'm not alone. He said, the Father who sent me is with, you, with me because I do always those things that please him. John 8 and verse 29. That's what made Jesus faithful in the sight of his Father. That's why the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He did always those things that pleased the Father. That's what you call faithfulness. I've never asked this question before. But if I, were to, if I, I think if I were to go into the great majority of our congregations and just out of the clear blue, say, okay, somebody quote a verse or part of a verse from the book of Revelation. Methinks one of the most common answers would be Revelation 2 and verse 10. At least the last part. But give Revelation 2 and verse 10 a, a full look. The, the part of the verse that we're familiar with is what? Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee your crown of life. Now that was part of the message that Jesus, through John, gave to the church in Smyrna. But before you get to that part about being faithful unto death, and I'll give thee your crown of life, before you get to that, Jesus basically says, here's what I see on the old horizon. He said, here's what you've got coming up in your lives. You've got suffering. You've got tribulation. You've got prison, and you've got death. Now, I believe the Bible teaches that God wants us to be faithful from now until the end of our lives. But I think the main major thrust of Revelation 2.10 is not the idea of you keep being faithful as long as you're breathing. But rather the idea is as you're suffering, as you face tribulation, as you go to prison, whatever it is, even if you lose your life for serving Jesus, if you do that, you'll receive a crown of life. Now, there's a picture of faithfulness which says what? For better or for worse, for rich or for poor, right? Sickness and in health, in prison or in freedom, I'm going to be faithful to my Lord. Now, that's faithfulness. And so as you get a concept of faithfulness, then you have a feeling for when that's absent, what do you got? Well, then you got a picture of unfaithfulness. Now, our second question is, we're not going to spend much time, how does unfaithfulness creep in? Now, our topic tonight, our assignment tonight, is not to discuss what can we do to prevent unfaithfulness. That, that's not the topic. And our topic tonight is not to discuss once someone becomes unfaithful, what can we do to get them out of that unfaithfulness. That's, that's not our topic. And our topic is not really how does it creep in, but I want to make this observation. I want to put this out on the table to be clear before we go any further. If I ever become unfaithful, or if anyone in here, anybody whom we know becomes unfaithful, it won't be God's fault. It, it won't be the devil's fault. It, it won't be the government's fault. It won't be the church's fault. If I become unfaithful, that is on me. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, and in verse number 12, the Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now whatever it was he's describing, he said we don't want this to happen to even one of you. He said we don't even we don't want even one of you to depart from the living God. Now does that sound to you like it's possible for a child of God to depart from the living God? Well yeah it's exactly what it is. But notice what he says. When, when, when one departs from the living God, what's going on inside that person? It's an evil heart of unbelief. It's a heart issue. 
when a person has been faithful and become unfaithful, that, that, that goes back to the heart. Jesus <coughs> said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what? Good things. Good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. Luke 6, 45. In another setting, Jesus used this language. Bad tree, bad fruit. Good tree, good fruit. Well, the point of Luke 6, 45 is, if we want our speech to be pure and our conduct to be pure, it all begins in the what? In the heart. And so that's why we read in Proverbs 4, 23, you give all diligence, keep your heart with all diligence. Uh, Satan might take my money, he may take a lot of my stuff, but he can't have my heart. And so if, if I become unfaithful, then that's time for me to man up and do what David did. Now, now David, boy, he got in some messes. But David had a contrite heart. And when David messed up, his heart was of such a nature that it killed him. And he would go to his God in prayer and he would acknowledge that. And one of the places we read such language is in Psalm 32 and, and verse number 5 where the psalmist wrote, I have acknowledged my I acknowledge my sin and I will confess my transgressions. He said, they're, they're mine. It's not my mama's fault. It's not the elder's fault. It's not the governor's fault. David said, these things so, so whenever unfaithfulness creeps in, it somehow is connected to the heart. But now let's look at our third thought, and that is, okay, when someone is in that category, they've become unfaithful, what's going on in their lives? Let me break it down into two categories. Number one, what's going on internally? And number two, how is that seen outwardly? Okay? What's going on inside of a person? When, when they've become unfaithful, well, they've lost some things. Number one, they've lost their desire to grow spiritually. You know, when a human being gets to a point in their life where they have no desire to eat and they refuse to eat, we all know how that's going to end. Well, Peter wrote to the Christians in the first century and he said, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? That you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2 and verse number 2. Well, when one who was faithful has become unfaithful, they don't have that appetite anymore. They're not hungry and thirsting for righteousness. They've lost their desire to mature spiritually. We know the expression of 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 7. And beside this, giving all diligence, adding to your faith, virtue, and virtue knowledge, and all of those things. And if you do these things, you'll never fall. And, and this person has become unfaithful in their soul, in their heart. What's their mindset? I hear you. I know what it says, but just, it, it's not on my radar right now. It's not on my agenda. It's not on my list of things. It, it's unimportant to me. They no longer are focusing on what it is to glorify the God of heaven. Paul said to the church in Corinth, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all the glory of God. First Corinthians 10 and verse 31, when one's becoming faithful, that's not his or her thinking. They're not thinking about growing. They're not thinking about those Christian graces. They're not thinking about glorifying God. And they're not thinking like Jesus was thinking. I want to do those things that please my Father. And they're certainly not thinking about what can I do to help lost souls become saved souls because they know that's not going to fly when they themselves are not living faithfully and they're trying to reach someone who's never obeyed the gospel. You know, Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22. That's not a part of the thing. So, so those things internally are going on in the life of a person when they become unfaithful. Look in your Bible if you'd like. In Deuteronomy chapter 10. So, so what's going on inside this person? If we wanted to summarize, and I understand. I understand that we're not living under the message of the old covenant. But, but here's a question that's asked. 
And an answer given, God speaking through Moses to the children of Israel. In chapter 10 of the book of Deuteronomy, verse number 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now when one is walking with God and is faithful to God, that's the mindset that person has. He has a, he has a healthy respect or fear for God. He's walking in all of God's ways. He's serving God with all the heart and he loves God with all of the heart. You know, sometimes in a marriage relationship, one of the spouses, or in some cases, both spouses, will say something like this. I've fallen out of love. I've fallen out of love with him. I'm not in love with her anymore. Well, when one has become unfaithful, that person has fallen out of love with the Creator. Now, they may claim and stammer and stutter and try to convince us they love God just as much as anybody. But the evidence indicates otherwise. <coughs> what God required of the Israelites in principle is the same He requires of us. To fear Him, walk in His ways, to serve Him with all the heart, and to love Him with all of our being. And so that person who at one point was seeking first the things that are above, that's no longer their mindset. That person who at one point was seeking first the kingdom of God and his rights, Matthew 6, 33, that's no longer what's going on. And so you've got, what, what, that's what's going on between their ears. Because in the Bible, the heart is the mind. That's what's going on inside. Now how does that show up on the outside? Well, in, in a variety of ways. One of the ways that shows up is in their conversations, people who become unfaithful, their conversations are not about serving the Lord. Their conversations are not about the work of the church. Their conversations are not about spiritual matters. Something else dominates their conversation. Now, that doesn't mean that even as we walk with the Lord, that in every sentence we're going to say, praise the Lord, or let's do the work of the church, or let's serve Jesus, or let's reach the lost. One of the things you'll find when somebody's unfaithful, they will never, ever, ever talk favorably about putting God first and serving Him in the right way. Number two, one of the ways you see it in their lives is their personal Bible study and their prayers are basically non-existent. They have cut off the lines of communication with the God of heaven. God speaks to us through his word and we speak to him through our prayers. As we sing with the, the little ones, read your Bibles, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. That, that's not going on with them. And so it becomes a cycle. Then what they need is strength from above, and they've cut off their ties to the one who provides the strength. And so their conversations are, are not about spiritual things. That they're not studying their Bible. They're not praying like they really need to. And they certainly don't have the mindset that the psalmist had. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse number one. Well, we recognize that this, this facility is not the house of the Lord, but this is a gathering of God's people. And the psalmist was saying, when it's time to go to the place of worship, that's a happy occasion for me. Well, when someone's unfaithful, that, that's not on their radar. That's not on their list of things to do, to be present with God's people. And they're certainly not fired up about doing the Lord's work. So those are some of the ways that that's seen. Now, let's get then to the question, and that is, okay, when unfaithfulness comes in, how does that affect the family? And let's be clear about this. Every case is, every case is different. So we talk about unfaithfulness, how it affects the home. Each case is, is unique, so there's nothing that's like, one size fits all. But, but know this. I mean, it's, it's, it's common sense. 
when one person in the family becomes unfaithful, or maybe more than one, that's going to change some aspects of the, of the family life. Things are going to change. An atmosphere which before was spiritually oriented, was centered around the church, it's no longer centered around the church in spiritual matters. It's centered around me and what I want, and it's centered around earthly things. Again, depending on the situation, who it is that's become unfaithful, there's going to be some level of division within the house. I'm not saying there's hatred. I'm not saying anybody's going to be in such a manner they're not going to want to get along with them, but there's going to be some type of division. Now, to what extent is that division going to exist? That's going to depend upon the behavior of the one who's become unfaithful. But Jesus said, among those who follow, he said, here's what you're going to face sometimes as his followers. He said there could be, and he used an illustration, a family of five people. He said it could end up being two against three or three against two. Luke chapter 12 and verse 52. Again, the extent of that division is going to depend upon the specific case that you have in mind. If it's one person, how is their unfaithfulness going to affect others? You know, there's a Bible warning in general about what? A little leaven, what? What's it do? It leavens a whole lump. First Corinthians 5 and verse number 6. And so that's, that's potential. Now, let, let's do this. Uh, let's break down the unfaithfulness and look at four different scenarios, okay? There, there may be others, but let, let, let's think about four. Let's say, okay, what happens if you got a married couple? And what if one of those Christians becomes unfaithful. When I say unfaithful, I'm not talking about unfaithful to them, I'm talking about unfaithful to God. If one of those mates becomes unfaithful, how's that going to affect the life at home? Well, I'd step back and ask this question. What extent of unfaithfulness are we talking about? He said, well, Roger, unfaithful is unfaithful. I, I get that. But in some cases, a person's unfaithfulness, they decided they're done going to services, and, but in terms of morality, that they're still, from a moral standpoint, that they're still living in, in a moral fashion. So in, in some cases, they simply stop going to services. In other cases, the person stops going to services, starts messing with pornography, starts hitting the bottle, starts abusing his spouse, and then he even steps out on the spouse. Now, you've gone way beyond just skipping services, right? And so in some cases, the unfaithfulness of the spouse may cause that marriage to crash and burn. May ultimately divorce. In many cases, it does. But there's potential. Now, I know when I bring up Old Testament examples, those are not Christian examples. You've got to understand. But you know, sometimes a person's mate, their influence is not very good. <coughs> what was it that Job's wife said to him when he was encountering some of his problems? What was her suggestion? Curse God and die. Right? Job 2, verse 9. Or Solomon. Solomon, you know, the beginning of his reign, the Bible says he loved the Lord. And then in his later years of life, the Bible says that his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. Now, shame on them for their influence. Shame on him for allowing that to happen. But the point is, his mates influence his thinking and influence his conduct. If I were to ask you tonight, who was the worst of the worst among the kings of Israel, we probably would unanimously say, Ahab, no question. And one of the reasons that Ahab took it to another level of wickedness was his sweetheart, right? Jezebel. The Bible says in 1 Kings 21 and verse 25 that she stirred him up to do evil. So I'm just saying in some cases, the spouse has a bad influence on the other that causes that other person to go down the wrong path. And so our appeal tonight would be for any brother or sister who faces the heartache of their Christian spouse becoming unfaithful to the Lord, our appeal would say, look, brother or sister, we, we hate what you're going through. 
But we want to encourage you in the best way we know how to be strong. To you, 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 you stand strong and you walk with God and you be the example you should be and you know what you ought to do and we'll keep praying for you and we'll keep praying for your husband. That was a different scenario entirely. But Proverbs, I'm sorry, Solomon, book of Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10, when he read the advice, he said, My son, when sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And he said, You don't walk with them. Proverbs 1 10 and verse 15. So sometimes the unfaithfulness involves one spouse. Here's a second scenario. Sometimes the unfaithfulness involves both parents becoming unfaithful. So our question would be. When both parents become unfaithful to the Lord, how does that influence, how does that affect their children? If there are children involved. Well, again, you can have different scenarios. If those children are three years old and five years old, that's one case. If those children still living at home are 17 and 19 years old, that's another case. But in a lot of cases, well, what's going to happen when mom and dad become unfaithful to the Lord? Well, they're no longer going to be having family time to pray together. And we're not doing that stuff. They're no longer having family time to read the Bible and sing together. That, that's, 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 that's no more. And so when those children, whether they're 3 and 5 or 17 and 19 years old, they looked up to mom and dad and they see mom and dad. They have no interest in going to services and what cases. <laughs> The little children either have no opportunity or they have no interest in going to services. And when mom and dad have lost their desire to study God's Word, those children no longer have the opportunity or desire to study God's Word. We're reminded of what we read in Judges 2 and verse 10 that after, after Joshua and his contemporary leaders in Israel, when they passed, the Bible says when Joshua was alive, Israel served Jehovah. But when Josh and his contemporary leaders passed away, there arose a generation, what's it say? There arose a generation which knew not God. Judges 2, verse 10. So there's going to be some consequences. So one case is when a spouse becomes unfaithful. A second case is when the parents become unfaithful. Here's a third case. You don't want to hear it, but we've got to talk about it. The third case is, what about when the children become unfaithful? How does that affect home life? It'll put, a, it'll put a hole in the heart of the parents the size of the Smoky Mountains. And those parents will lose sleep and they'll become irritable and they'll go through a vicious cycle. They don't ever want to think about their children being lost. And then the next phase of the cycle is that's the only thing they can think about. And in some cases, the mom blames the dad and the dad blames the mom and their relationship spirals out of control. And they go to divorce court. They're not blaming the kids, but because of the kids' unfaithfulness, mom blames dad and dad blames mom. It's terrible. Jesus said this. Jesus said, a man who hears my words and he goes and he does them. He's like to a wise man. Here comes our song, right? He's like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And he said, if a man hears my sayings, but he goes and he doesn't do them, he's like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. In the words of Jesus, paraphrasing, a wise human being, a wise son, obeys Jesus. An unwise human being, an unwise child, doesn't obey Jesus. What does that do to mom and dad? Well, in Proverbs 10, verse 1, the Bible says, a wise son, New Testament language, he, he, he obeys Jesus. A wise son maketh a glad father. But a foolish son is the heaviness or grief of his mother. So, so when children at some point, whether they're still in their teenage years living at home or they get out on their own, when they become, if they become unfaithful to the Lord, that's going to have an influence. It's going to have an influence on, on mom and dad. 
And our appeal tonight would be to anyone who is facing that scenario in their life with their children not being what God wants them to be. Don't beat yourself up. They are making their choices. And they're going to be accountable for those choices, not you. You and I, in our imperfect ways, to the best of our abilities, we try to live in the right way, we try to teach them in the right way. And now if at some point in their life they get to a phase where serving the Lord is it's not what they want to do, that's their choice. Now listen, here's a four scenario. So we talked about three scenarios so far. Number one, when a single spouse becomes unfaithful. Number two, when both parents become unfaithful. Number three, when the ch some children become unfaithful. And number four, when a sibling becomes unfaithful. You know, in some families, it wasn't the case of mine, because I wasn't that close in age to my brother and sister, but in some families, two brothers or two sisters are not only biological Siblings, they're besties. <laughs> they're best friends. And they would take anybody to the mat. <laughs> they take anybody out beside the behind the woodshed and straighten them out if they picked on their sister or picked on their brother. And if their biological brother or sister, who's also their brother or sister in the Lord, if they become unfaithful, it's a dagger to them. But if we ever face that, then the truth is the truth is the truth, regardless of who's involved. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and, and verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of dark, darkness, but, but rather reprove them. Now, here's, here's what needs to happen, okay? Well, we need dads. We need dads slash fathers to step up and say to their families, We've not always done it the right way. But God being our help, here's how it's going to be in our family moving forward. When the church needs our help, they can count on us. When it's time for the saints to assemble, we'll be there. We're never going to get out of schedule for the month and say, now which days are we going to need to be gone so we can miss services? We're never going to have that conversation. And when it comes to Saturday night and we're contemplating our Sunday activities, we're never, ever, ever going to have the conversation. Are we going tomorrow? And if we go, when are we going? We're never going to have this conversation. Because your mom and I are deciding right now, when the church needs us, we'll be there. And when it's time to assemble, we'll be there. One final thought, and then we're going to close. If someone in my family becomes unfaithful, or someone that's a dear friend becomes unfaithful. There's some things in my life that will never change, regardless of what anybody else does. Number one, my responsibility to my God will never change. And number two, my responsibility to my fellow man will never change, regardless of what anybody else does. Remember that. So tonight we looked at what does faithfulness look like? How does unfaithfulness creep in? How does unfaithfulness show itself internally and externally? And how does it affect family life? Let me encourage you back with two verses and put these ideas together, and I think it's a wonderful fit. Proverbs 3 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. God, how much do you want me to trust in you with all you got? And then put that together with Psalm 62 and verse 8. Trust in the Lord at all times. That pretty well covers it, doesn't it? Trust in the Lord with all you got, and trust in the Lord with all your heart. May God bless us to help each other to get to Him.